Chapter 1 How, When and Where How important are dates? There was a time when historians were fascinated with the dates. There were heated debates about the dates on which rulers were crowned or battles were fought. In the common sense notion, history was synonymous with dates. You may have heard people say, I find history boring because it is all about memorizing dates. Is such a conception true? History is certainly about changes that occur over time. It is about finding out how things were in the past and how things have changed. As soon as we compare the past with the present, we refer to time. We talk of before and after. Living in the world, we do not always ask historical questions about what we see around us. We take things for granted, as if what we see has always been in the world we inhabit. But most of us have our moments of wonder. When we are curious and we ask questions that actually are historical, watching someone sip a cup of tea at a roadside tea stall, you may wonder, when did people begin to drink tea or coffee? Looking out of the window of a train, you may ask yourself, when were railways built and how did people travel long distances before the age of railways? Reading the newspaper in the morning, you may be curious to know how people got to hear about things before newspapers began to be printed. All such historical questions refer us back to notions of time. But time does not have to be always precisely dated in terms of a particular year or a month. Sometimes it is actually incorrect to fix precise dates to processes that happen over a period of time. People in India did not begin drinking tea one fine day. They developed a taste for it over time. There can be no one clear date for a process such as this. Similarly, we cannot fix one single date on which British rule was established, or the national movement started, or changes took place within the economy and society. All these things happened over a stretch of time. We can only refer to a span of time, an approximate period over which particular changes became visible. Why then do we continue to associate history with a string of dates? This association has a reason. There was a time when history was an account of battles and big events. It was about rulers and their policies. Historians wrote about the year a king was crowned, the year he married, the year he had a child, the year he fought a particular war, the year he died, and the year the next ruler succeeded to the throne. For events such as these, specific dates can be determined, and in histories such as these, debates about dates continue to be important. As you have seen in the history textbooks of the past two years, historians now write about a host of other issues and other questions. They look at how people earned their livelihood what they produced and ate, how cities developed and markets came up, how kingdoms were formed and new ideas spread, and how cultures and society changed. Which dates? By what criteria do we choose a set of dates as important? The dates we select, the dates around which we compose our story of the past, are not important on their own. They become vital because we focus on a particular set of events as important. If our focus of study changes, if we begin to look at new issues, a new set of dates will appear significant. Consider an example in the histories written by British historians in India. The rule of each Governor-General was important. These histories began with the rule of the first Governor-General, Warren Hastings, and ended with the last Viceroy, 
Lord Mountbatten. In separate chapters, we read about the deeds of others. Hastings, Wellesley, Bentick, Dalhousie, Canning, Lawrence, Lytton, Ripon, Curzon, Harding, Irwin. It was a seemingly never-ending succession of governor generals and viceroys. All the dates in these history books were linked to these personalities, to their activities, policies, achievements. It was as if there was nothing outside their lives that was important for us to know. The chronology of their lives marked the different chapters of the history of British India. Can we not write about the history of this period in a different way? How do we focus on the activities of different groups and classes in Indian society within the format of this history of governor generals? When we write history or a story, we divide it into chapters. Why do we do this? It is to give each chapter some coherence. It is to tell a story in a way that makes some sense and can be followed. In the process, we focus only on those events that help us to give shape to the story we are telling. In the histories that revolve around the life of British Governor Generals, the activities of Indians simply do not fit. They have no space. What then do we do? Clearly, we need another format for our history. This would mean that the old dates will no longer have the significance they earlier had. A new set of dates will become more important for us to know. How do we periodize? In 1817, James Mill, a Scottish economist and political philosopher, published a massive three-volume work, A History of British India. In this, he divided Indian history into three periods, Hindu, Muslim and British. This periodization came to be widely accepted. Can you think of any problem with this way of looking at Indian history? Why do we try and divide history into different periods? We do so in an attempt to capture the characteristics of a time, its central features as they appear to us. So the terms through which we periodize, that is demarcate, the difference between periods become important. They reflect our ideas about the past. They show how we see the significance of the change from one period to the next. Mill thought that all Asian societies were at a lower level of civilization than Europe. According to his telling of history, before the British came to India, Hindu and Muslim despots ruled the country. Religious intolerance, caste taboos, and superstitious practices dominated social life. British rule, Mill felt, could civilize India. To do this, it was necessary to introduce European manners, arts, institutions, and laws in India. Mill, in fact, suggested that the British should conquer all the territories of India to ensure the enlightenment and happiness of the Indian people. For India was not capable of progress without British help. In this idea of history, British rule represented all the forces of progress and civilization. The period before British rule was one of darkness. Can such a conception be accepted today? In any case, can we refer to any period of history as Hindu or Muslim? Did not a variety of faiths exist simultaneously in these periods? Why should we characterize an age only through the religion of the rulers of the time? To do so is to suggest that the lives and practices of the others do not really matter. We should also remember that even rulers in ancient India did not all share the same faith. Moving away from British classification, historians have usually divided Indian history into ancient, medieval, and modern. 
This division 2 has its problems. It is a periodization that is borrowed from the West where the modern period was associated with the growth of all the forces of modernity, science, reason, democracy, liberty and equality. Medieval was a term used to describe a society where these features of modern society did not exist. Can we uncritically accept this characterization of the modern period to describe the period of our study? As you will see in this book, under British rule, people did not have equality, freedom or liberty, nor was the period one of economic growth and progress. Many historians therefore refer to this period as colonial. What is colonial? In this book, you will read about the way the British came to conquer the country and establish their rule subjugating local Nawabs and Rajas. You will see how they established control over the economy and society, collected revenue to meet all their expenses, bought the goods they wanted at low prices, produced crops they needed for export, and you will understand the changes that came about as a consequence. You will also come to know about the changes British rule brought about in values and tastes, customs and practices. When the subjugation of one country by another leads to these kinds of political, economic, social and cultural changes, we refer to the process as colonization. You will, however, find that all classes and groups did not experience these changes in the same way. That is why the book is called Our Pasts in the Plural. How do we know? What sources do historians use in writing about the last 250 years of Indian history? Administration produces records. One important source is the official records of the British administration. The British believed that the act of writing was important. Every instruction, plan, policy decision, agreement, investigation had to be clearly written up. Once this was done, things could be properly studied and debated. This conviction produced an administrative culture of memos, notings and reports. The British also felt that all important documents and letters needed to be carefully preserved, so they set up record rooms attached to all administrative institutions. The village Tasildar's office, the collectorate, the commissioner's office, the provisional secretariats, the, the law courts all had their record rooms. Specialized institutions like archives and museums were also established to preserve important records. Letters and memos that moved from one branch of the administration to another in the early years of the 19th century can still be read in the archives. You can also study the notes and reports that district officials prepared or the instructions and directives that were sent by the officials at the top to provincial administrators. In the early years of the 19th century, these documents were carefully copied out and beautifully written by calligraphists, that is, by those who specialized in the art of beautiful writing. By the middle of the 19th century, with the spread of printing, multiple copies of these records were printed as proceedings of each government department. Surveys become important. The practice of surveying also became common under the colonial administration. The British believed that a country had to be properly known before it could be effectively administered. By the early 19th century, detailed surveys were being carried out to map the entire country. In the villages, revenue surveys were conducted. The effort was to know the topography the soil quality, 
the flora, the fauna, the local histories, and the cropping pattern. All the facts seen as necessary to know about to administer the region. From the end of the 19th century, census operations were held every 10 years. These prepared detailed records of the number of people in all the provinces of India, noting information on castes, religions and occupation. There were many other surveys, botanical surveys, geological surveys, archaeological surveys, anthropological surveys, forest surveys. What official records do not tell? From this vast corpus of records, we can get to know a lot, but we must remember that these are official records. They tell us what the officials thought, what they were interested in and, and what they wish to preserve for posterity. These records do not always help us understand what other people in the country felt and what lay behind their actions. For that we need to look elsewhere. When we begin to search for these other sources, we find them in plenty, though they are more difficult to get than official records. We have diaries of people, accounts of pilgrims and travellers, autobiographies of important personalities and popular booklets that were sold in the local bazaars. As printing spread, newspapers were published and issues were debated in public. Leaders and reformers wrote to spread their ideas. Poets and novelists wrote to express their feelings. All these sources, however, were produced by those who were literate. From these, we will not be able to understand how history was experienced and lived by the tribals and the peasants, the workers in the mines or the poor on the streets. Getting to know their lives is a more difficult task. Yes, this can be done if you make a little bit of effort. When you read this book, you will see how this can be done.